Today, there are more than 1,300 full-power UHF digital television stations on the air in the United States. Most of them use IoT amplifiers for their final output stage due to their high efficiency compared with solid-state UHF transmitters. Most stations today have two IoT transmitters working in parallel to produce their final output power to the antenna. Some use a solid-state backup transmitter, but at the higher power levels, the solid-state transmitters use more electrical power than a tube transmitter does. IOTs are used around the world for television broadcasting. But what is an IOT, and how does it work? Here you can see an IOT in its native environment inside its cabinet, connected to the transmitter making power. And here you can see a naked IOT, stripped of its support apparatuses, the way it comes from the factory. From the outside, it appears fairly small, a simple cylinder, but that is not the case. It took many decades to arrive at today's IoT, and it wasn't until 1988 that NMAC, a division of CPI, developed the current power amplifier tube in use around the world. At first, they called it a klystrode because it combined the properties of a klystron and a triode tube, but that name did not stick. And when other companies developed their own versions, the name Inductive Output Tube, or IoT, came about. In order to understand how the IoT works, let's step back into the world of electron tubes for a moment. The triode electron tube was developed by Lee DeForest back in 1906 and was the basis for all electronic equipment up to the discovery of the transistor in the late 1940s. The triode electron tube is a three-element device consisting of a cathode, plate, and control grid. It operates thus. A filament heats the cathode. This makes the cathode more emissive. In other words, the electrons of a hot cathode are more easily released. With a positive voltage applied to the plate, it draws the electrons from the cathode to it. Opposites attract. The control grid intercepts these flowing electrons and with a small input signal can control the flow of electrons to the plate. The change in the number of electrons alters the current flow and the voltage drop across the plate resistor. This results in an amplification of the grid's input signal at the tube's plate. The principle of any electronic amplifier is that a relatively small input signal can control a much larger electron flow, thus producing an increase in the desired signal. And that's just what an IoT does, but in a slightly different way. Here's our naked IoT again. Now let's take a look inside. And let's turn it upside down so it is oriented the same way as our triode was. You'll see why they are operated the way they are later. IoTs have a heater, the same as any tube. They operate on 6 volts, but with a current draw from 6 to 25 amps. These are big heaters. The cathode is concave, or bowl-shaped. This starts the process of shaping the electron beam. The cathode is warmed indirectly by the heater to become more emissive. In fact, high voltage cannot be applied until the heater has stabilized, which takes several minutes. To control the beam of electrons traveling from the cathode to the collector, the grid is biased to limit the amount of electrons. The amount of current flowing through the IoT with no RF applied is called the idle current, and that sets the gain of the tube also. The actual grid is made of pyrolytic graphite. It is shaped to fit the concave cathode and is mounted very close to it, about 0.01 millimeters in fact. The pyrolytic graphite conducts like copper, but can handle the heat of the cathode without deforming. 
Now the plate in an IoT is called the collector, and because of the relatively long distance between the cathode and the collector, a much higher voltage is required to draw the electrons from the cathode. IoTs utilize a cathode to collector voltage of between 27,000 and 38,000 volts. As the beam of electrons strike the collector, it must dissipate that spent energy in the form of excess heat. It must be removed to keep the collector from melting. So the collector is surrounded by water, or a glycol water mix. The warmed coolant is sent to a heat exchanger where it is cooled and returned to the IoT, just like a car's engine is cooled by its antifreeze passing through the radiator. This cooling fluid that surrounds the collector is the reason for turning the IoT upside down, so that the collector is at the bottom where the coolant can easily drain out. Because the collector is in contact with a flowing coolant, it needs to be at ground potential. In order to make the collector slash plate positive relative to the cathode, the high voltage negative lead is attached to the cathode where it sits at a negative 30,000 volts, while the collector remains at ground potential. With such high voltage in such tight spaces, there's always a possibility of internal arcing. Great care is taken in the design and construction of the IoT to reduce the possibility but it can still happen. That is why crowbar protection circuits are used in every IoT transmitter to quickly stop any arcs that do occur. You can learn more about crowbars from our video tutorial, Crowbars in IoT Transmitters, on our website. Now that there is a beam of electrons flowing within the IoT, they must be prevented from spreading and striking the sides of the tube. This is accomplished with electromagnets. The magnetic fields constrict the electrons into a small tight beam that will travel the length of the tube and only come in contact with the collector. But there are some stray electrons that do strike the sides of the tube. This is called body current and it must be kept to a very low level. Another aspect of IoTs is maintaining their internal vacuum and preventing the buildup of any gases within. To do this, an ion pump is used. A voltage is applied to the ion pump that ionizes any gas molecules which are then attracted to a getter within the tube. A typical ion voltage is 3.7 kilovolts with zero current draw. Any current drawn by the ion pump indicates the presence of gas within the tube. This can lead to arcing. Over time, the ion pump will remove the gas as indicated by the ion current being reduced to zero. So now we have an IoT pulling a beam of electrons from the cathode to the collector. Now, how do we amplify the RF signal? There are three RF cavities for an IoT. The input cavity, primary output cavity, and the secondary output cavity. Together they connect the IoT with the RF world. Coming from the exciter and amplified by IPAs, approximately 200 watts of RF is fed to the input cavity which is tuned for resonance and impedance matching at the operating frequency. Now the input is where the IoT differs from the Klystron tube, which was widely used for UHF broadcasting up until the arrival of the IoT and digital broadcasting. The IoT's input cavity is positioned to direct the input RF directly to the space between the cathode and the grid. As the RF interacts with the grid, it modulates the voltage between the grid and the cathode. In this way, the electron beam becomes density modulated, where the electrons are bunched together in one part and spaced apart in the following section, following the RF input signal. 
As the density modulated beam of electrons flows down through the body of the IoT, they pass the output gap of the tube. This is where the primary output cavity is located. The modulated beam of electrons interact with this resonant tuned cavity, and a probe intercepts this energy and transfers it to the secondary output cavity. Finally, a second probe extracts the RF energy from the secondary output cavity and connects it to a coaxial transmission line, where the signal can be filtered, switched, and sent to the antenna for broadcast. The tuning of the input, primary, and secondary output cavities, as well as the position of the load coupler to the coaxial transmission line, determines the bandwidth and envelope shape of the output RF, as well as the overall gain of the tube. Hi, and welcome to The Online Engineer. I'm Russ Brown. I hope you enjoyed that video on how IoTs operate and that you learned something useful from it. Don't forget, we have many more videos on our website at www.theonlineengineer.org. Thanks for watching.